do one thing and do it really, really well. Simple, good food, done well. Low budget, really humble, go back to the roots and just cook good food and great food and great service, lots of smiles, keep the positivity high. And, and so we, we, that, that was part of the plan. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Before the pandemic, passion projects were a big part of the industry, but often they didn't turn a profit. With the pandemic putting old school hospitality operations into question and a more clearly defined roadmap ahead, will passion projects and bespoke hospitality experiences come to the fore, proliferate and flourish? Jesse McTavish is a co-owner of Bar Elvina in Avalon Beach, New South Wales. Jesse, how are you going? Very well, thanks, Huck. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining us. You've just opened the doors about a week ago of Bar Elvina. What's it been like setting up a venue during this time? <laughs> Most people called us crazy um, straight away. <laughs> but... but um, we, we had a full mind shift, I think, when we first looked at it and said the only way we can do it is if we plan this really, really well. Um, and so the, the actual build um, was, pretty, was planned out really well. We did most of the work ourselves. Went back to real bare bones um, you know, you know, venue building, you know, doing everything ourselves, as much trade as we could do ourselves, the trade work, calling in favours from lots of really kind friends and helping us out um, and very patient friends um, that helped as well but I think the, the biggest thing was planning it and and looking at numbers and seeing if it was if it was going to be possible at all um, and when we when we went through the numbers and figured that we prop, it is a possibility we could do it then we've, we had enough confidence to, to do it to sign the lease and go for it where did the idea of Bar Alvina originate? Uh, my business partner Andy Emerson and I were were um, were doing a quick road trip before the borders shut. Uh, we literally got out two days before the borders shut to, to Victoria. Um, we were going down to Lake's entrance um, to to to, to uh, pursue a little project we've got going on the side of uh, making Australian tinned anchovies. And we've been trying to do this for a little bit, which is kind of fun. And the, and the reason why we did that was because someone said we couldn't do it. And so we're like, oh, surely we could. Uh, and and with help from a bunch of people like John Sussman and um, a few other crew, we got in contact with the Mitchelson family down in uh, Lake Entrance. So we decided to go take go, um, you know, a fourth generation um, anchovy fisherman. So we thought we'd go down and have a visit, go and see them and visit them and talk about this idea. And as we're going down, we stopped at Malakuta because it's one of my favourite towns. Over the years, I've fished there and surfed there a lot and really wanted to get back down there after the bushfires and see them and just go to the local pub, stay there, spend some money in town um, and just and meet a couple of people I know in town there and just see how they're going. And so we thought we'd stop there for the night and take a boat out in the morning on the lake and... We had a bunch of uh, had a bunch of oysters that John uh, Blanco from Mimosa Rocks gave us on the way through, and we'll sit on the bank of a, of the Malakuta Top Lake, and we had some oysters. I caught a little tailor, and we cooked it up on over a fire, and we're sitting there eating these oysters and having a Nangara Chardonnay, and we're like, we should- you reckon we could do this in a commercial sense? <laughs> do you reckon it would translate? Just having good booze and good food again? Is it going to happen again? And we looked at each other and we're like, miss it, all right? We miss it. We miss doing it. We miss being a part of it and that buzz and the stoke we get from making people happy and filling them full of booze and food, <laughs> you know? And we looked at each other and we said, man, we've got to find a place, right? And... Yeah, you know, we we sort of changed, shifted our mindset from being, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's all going to change. It's going to be horrible and terrible. We looked at it. Well, maybe there's a good opportunity here to to reset, restructure, and change the formula of what of what the old formula was. The old formula wasn't attainable for us. Um, of you know, of, of huge investment, huge venue. We said, let's just go back to the old school of making a making a restaurant by a wine bar, you know. With whatever we've got, and so that's that was the idea. It bred from there. 
um, yeah, it was it was pretty exciting because we and we thought about it for quite a while, um, and the note obviously then we had to find a site. That's the biggest challenge. Yeah, so then we were looking up um, northern beaches because I, I do love Avalon and surfing up that way, and and Andy lives there. Yeah, he actually lives around the corner from the bar, and he he rang me up one day. He goes, "Is am I going crazy? Is this a good deal? Is this place a good deal?" And I was like. Let's just go check it out. So we went there and we sat there. We went and visited five times, met with the owner of the building. And the fifth time we said, do you mind if we just have a look at ourselves, stay in here for about an hour and a half and just get a feel. And we cracked a bottle of wine again <laughs> and just sat there sat there drinking wine in this space that was that just had the bones and the potential that we couldn't, couldn't argue with. It was just we, just, we knew that if we could do it for the right Right, um, right, uh, capital. We're right. We're okay. Um, yeah. All the numbers actually added up. You mentioned that uh, the old school of thinking was a big investment, a larger venue. Um, can you tell us a bit about this operation? How big is the site? How many people are you expecting to to have in the venue, and and what sort of um, outlay and impact is it having on you guys? We um, we are allowed 65 at the moment under current COVID restrictions, which I was just reading today. Hopefully, we have a bit of a change in New South Wales over this week. Um, so that was that was really heavily negotiated in in the lease. So we we negotiated back and forth really heavily to put in basically a, a COVID clause almost, you know, um, because it was so unknown. This was this was three months ago that we signed. That was first negotiating, sorry, and we we essentially went back to the owner and said, "Hey, you know, we can't make money unless this is going to happen. It's just not possible. We know the margins in Hospo." Uh, and he agreed. He's he's um, he's been in hospitality for years and years and years, which really helped. He was incredibly understanding, um, and he's you know he's had restaurants for the last fifty years, so he understood completely, which really helped. He, he really felt felt for us. Um, so he offered, you know, if, if COVID happens again, then, then we don't pay rent. Simple as that. And he put that straight up in the lease, which is really lovely. And, and I think that was, that was probably the one that got us over the line that we knew. Worst, worst case scenario, um, we, the landlord has our back. So that was, that was really kind of uh, uh, encouraging, I suppose. Uh, and then, so, so the p- potential is 120 in the venue, which is fantastic. Um, and and there's a because it's quite a diverse little, little venue with a with a bar, a, a terrace, a dining room, and then an outside area at the back where the garden's going in in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so it's it's so it's a it's a fun venue, but it's, it's I think it's having that vision that that Andy especially has, and and I know how to swing a swing a hammer, <laughs> so, so that that helped as well. <laughs> And we, we sat down and the, and the vision was clear. We both had exactly the same vision of what we wanted it to be. Um, and we knew that we'd only be able to, we'd have to scrape, out, scrape in all the, um, all the favours, call in all the favours. Um, so it's kind of exciting, yeah. Well, we know that you're a real talent on the tools in the kitchen and you said you can swing a hammer. <laughs> but what was it like swinging the hammer? Do you have any stories you can tell us? It, it was great. Oh, yeah. When you come in, just don't look too closely at the um, <laughs> at the banquet seating. <laughs> I built the banquet, and there's gaps everywhere. It's awful. Oh my goodness! Uh, when when COVID first happened, I had um I had a, a business consulting business. I was I just started, and I was working overseas. Had three contracts lined up um, in Kuwait City, Bangkok, and Bali, and obviously they all cancelled. So, so it was pretty wild, but on the plus side, um, I've got a bunch of mates that are tradies, and they just said, "Well, come and labour for us." So, so I was roofing for three months, which was fantastic. Up on up on roofs and hanging around and harnesses, it was great fun. I found it so enjoyable. I come home happy, and my, my fiance Ali was just like, "Man, you come home so happy after labouring." I'm like, "It's so easy. You just you just." You make a mistake, you fix it. It's fine. <laughs> it's unreal. I, I really enjoyed it. But, so I started buying some tools, and I've always liked working on cars and stuff like that. And so no, I don't mind using tools and that, which was great because when when Andy 
Uh, Andy rings up and he goes, we're going to have to do the work ourselves, eh? And I said, yep. He goes, I'm t he goes to me, I'm terrible with a saw. And I went, okay. I said, no worries. I said, do you know how to hold a drill? He goes, I know how to dr hold a drill. I just don't know how to turn it on. I was like, done. I'll sort it out. I'm, I'm your guy. <laughs> your admin guy, I'm, I'm the tool guy. <laughs> so it was cool. But uh, yeah, there's a few, there's a few, um, few dodgy bits of workmanship going on in there. <laughs> That's to say we've got load-bearing zip ties. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that at the beginning of the pandemic, you lost some consulting gigs overseas. What did it feel like at that time? And, and how do you feel about that, given that borders are still closed? How do you feel about international travel? Uh, it was hard at the time, definitely. Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty tough. And thankfully, I was, I was really glad that, that my partner, Ali, was still with Solitel. She works, works with Solitel. And they supported her really well, which is fantastic as a company and that was that was um, encouraging for us and gave us a sense of security a little with with it was hard with um with the government uh, helps because i was a brand new business brand new and didn't have any employees because that's just me so i didn't i didn't actually qualify for job keeper so it was pretty tough but it was all right thankfully i just had some laboring jobs but losing those consulting jobs hurt um Thankfully, I was able to do some of it remotely, and we adapted, which was kind of cool. With Q8, I, I uh, designed each of the, the dishes, designed a whole menu. It ended up being 42 dishes, and cooked them and photographed them at home, and sent over the photographs, and then sent over videos on instructions of how to cook it, how to cook the dishes. And so that was pretty cool. It was hard work, though. <laughs> it was really hard work. <laughs> But it was, yeah, it was it was tough trying to get it, and, and doing it in a domestic kitchen too was was a battle. But I called in a few favors again. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was pretty tough. You've worked for many great restaurants. Uh, and what led you down the road to consulting? Um, I think I think it's the the enjoyment that you, you get when you design a menu and train staff, and they just they see the instant. Uh, changes. They see the instant change in revenue, and and more importantly, in the attitude of the kitchen as well. You go in and you come in with this fresh, fresh uh, culture, or not culture. You just come in with a fresh attitude and a fresh look at the business, and it really quickly shows um, you know, anyone who anyone in the kitchen who wants to go along with that change, and anyone who doesn't. Um, and so you can you can get a chance to restructure the culture of a kitchen, and and reset it. And I, I love that going in there and, and making an impact, making a really positive impact in a business, and then and then following up and seeing how that goes. And the the, the restaurants or the businesses that I was I was working with were all family businesses except the Q8 one. Sorry, with other were family businesses. So they really appreciate it. We have a really close relationship with this still now with these people, and um, and that really that that make, makes it personal for me. And that was that was really enjoyable, it was satisfying, really satisfying. Um, and it was without the ongoing stress of doing 70 hours on your feet because I'm getting old, Huck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to get a bit old. Having said that, I just did 90 <laughs> in the wine bar last week. So that's a good figure. Wow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what, what led to a career in, in hospitality? Uh, I was sitting around the table at home in, in Lennox Head. Uh, we were living on the beach. It was a cracking spot. It's just such a beautiful place to grow up. And we're sitting there. I was, I was in year 10 at school, at Byron Bay High School. And um, I was sitting there with mum. Actually, I, was, I got up and I was making tortillas with mum. And as you do as a 14 or 15 year old. And uh, mum goes, What do you want to do? Do you want to stay on till year 12 or do you want to leave and do a trade? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I really don't know. And I was thinking about you know, something doing, teaching art or something like that. Or um, there's an opportunity to go and, and to you know, further a career in drama or in acting, something like that. And I was sitting there and mum goes, what about, what about a chef? What about being a chef? And I was sitting there rolling it. I remember this is being very honest. I thought, oh, yeah, chicks dig chefs. <laughs> I promise you, a 15-year-old boy, that's all you're thinking of. And I thought, chicks dig chefs. Little did I know that you would then go and have a relationship and not see the person that you're, <laughs> you're with <laughs> for 15 hours of the day. <laughs> And chicks don't dig chefs sometimes. 
But, you know, but that's exactly what I thought. So the next day I went up to the beach hotel in Byron and walked into the kitchen. There was an old Spanish chef in there, uh, Valentino, his name was executive chef of the beach hotel at the time. Before um, uh, before the other career came in, it was, it was like 1995. And I went up there and said, I just want to start an apprenticeship. And he goes, okay, start next week. So I left school and went and did my trade. That was it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> there should be more career advisors around, I think, just <laughs> telling 15-year-olds telling to slow down and <laughs> think about it first. <laughs> You've been involved in many uh, amazing venues over the years, from the Kettle Black to North Bondi Fish and many more in between. What's been some real highlights and influences over your career? Uh, good question. Um, I, I really enjoyed that period with Top Paddock and Kettle Black. And I was just saying to Andy yesterday, we've, we've had an amazing opening with Barovina. It's just been, the, the response has been phenomenal. And I, I'm just, my mind's blown. And I hadn't, hadn't felt that since we first opened Top Paddock. I remember looking over at Nathan Tolman on the first day and just went, wow, we've created something special. This is amazing. Of course, that was off the back of a lot of his restaurants and his success that, that, that he and Diamond and Ben had already set up, which is full credit to them. But we, at Top Paddock, just just something was different and the, the formula was right and it felt amazing. That feeling felt so good. And I was like, I think I felt that again yesterday, <laughs> you know. It was a really cool feeling. So that was definitely a highlight. The top paddock kettleback days were, were pretty pretty amazing. Um, and prior to that, I, I remember working with an Italian family in 2000 down at Four Olives Deli, the owners of Fourth Village Provador. And I talk about these guys all the time. Because they are the loveliest people and there's no airs, no graces, but they just love good produce. And that's what, they were the first people to really drive home the appreciation of good produce for me. And when, when you're curing your own olives out the back and you know, cracking green olives and curing um, black olives out the back of the, the shop and and he's got his own olive oil press at Picolba and you know, pulling his own olive oil off a stone press and he's like, Oh, that's what you're talking about. That's real. That's real appreciation for good quality produce, and that the, that was a really oh, real eye open. I didn't appreciate it as much as I did at the time, uh, but as I did do now. Sorry, but I have seen the guys um, Peter and Annette again recently, and and really told them how much I really appreciated them showing me that. It was kind of kind of fun, and and of all places, I found it in a deli. You know, not not in a not in a three hatter or, or anywhere else. Just in a in a humble delicatessen. It's kind of cool. Can you tell us a bit about your cooking? Was was there a moment in time when you realised, yeah, you are a good chef and you found your voice on the plate? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, mate. <laughs> I like. I, I, people always ask you when they go, so what's your what's your favourite thing to cook? You know, I don't know. <laughs> people go, so what's your what's your favourite dish you ever cooked? And you're like, I have no idea. I. I uh, maybe it's a short attention span, but I don't know what it is. I, do, I just, it's not a perfectionist thing or anything like that. I just, I get too, too excited and about stuff. And it always, the beauty about cooking for me is that it's always changing and it always evolves and develops and changes. And just when you think that everything's been done, you you get some sort of tangent that your brain goes on and, and you go, oh, cool, yeah, that's it. I'm going to run down that tangent. And like even even with Elvina, you know, there's we, we've we set up a structure for the menu that that I, that I like the whole menu to fit into. And it's, it's three, four principles. One is it's got to be on brand. It's got to look the part. It's got to be the brand is salty and ocean and coastal. So it's got to be on brand. It's got to have some element in there on brand of, of local produce. So something out of the sand dunes, something off the beaches, even the seafood out of the Hawkesbury. Second, it's got to be cost effective. Got to make money off it. Third, it's got to work in the kitchen in the, with our limitations of the cooking equipment and the amount of staff we have. But the biggest one, the fourth one, is it's got to be bloody delicious. And it's just, it was cool to have that, kept to categorize that the first time in my career. And the dishes come in, we see if they tick all the boxes. And it's unreal the dishes that are coming out, because you can have a dish that's that's you know three moves, it can be literally three moves, but the building blocks of flavour have been developed over over weeks and weeks and months sometimes, 
but the, the dish is three moves because it fits into the kitchen and it tastes unreal. And, you're like, and, the, and the guys in the kitchen are pumping this food out at just such precise levels because there's only two moves in it. Cooking a, cooking a flounder perfectly over charcoal and serving it with sautéed warrigal greens and miso lemon butter sauce. That's it. And it's tasty as. But the miso, obviously, you know, we're making the miso ourselves. Warrigal greens we get out of the garden up, up at um, Palm Beach, pull out of the bushes out of Palm Beach. And the, and the flounder through our great supplier at, at uh, the fish market. Just simple stuff done well. One of the identifying features of your cooking is a real love for seafood. Where, where did that all start from? Uh, my pop, I reckon. My, my grandfather uh, t- took me fishing because we, we lived on the beach at Lennox Head, which is a real tough upbringing, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's just living, living in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> we're such spoiled brats around here aren't we <laughs> it's unbelievable growing up on, literally on the beach at Lennox and um, and I mean I mean, it's a rough times of course there was you know mum and dad went through some financial heavy financial challenges and we were renting on the beach and you know five kids five annoying kids to feed and um, and surfboard shaping you know doesn't wasn't exactly the most uh, high income <laughs> earning big, um, profession around uh, and, but we'd, we'd fish over the front most days. We'd surf every day, but we'd walk over the front. And there's a little spot there called the brim hole and uh, and the boat channel, and we'd flick a dirty old, smelly old prawn in there. And my pop would teach me how to how to catch whiting and flathead, and and the, and the mighty long tom, which was the first fish that I ever caught. <laughs> the horrible, horrible things. Um, but I always loved seafood. So then, Dad bought me a spear gun early days. So I'd cruise through there and I'd shoot mullet and, and brim and stuff like that and cook it up uh, and then that was and and as kids we'd, we'd just run rummage around on the rocks always on the rocks on low tide at the at the um at the boat channel lift up rocks find crabs underneath it grab crabs and see these things run scurrying around the, the rock pools just a complete um just com- absolutely infatuated with with the, with the ocean and that just turned more and more into a proper proper love i suppose without saying too cheesy but it's um, it really it really is a love love for the ocean. Those my days off were, you know, just you go to the beach with a board and a fishing rod, and no bait, never never any bait. You can find your bait so easily. Jump, you know, walk along, grab some pippies, uh, jump on your board, paddle the board out, stro- with your with your with your fishing rod, throw the rod in with the pippy on it, paddle back to, to shore, take away back to shore, leave the bait out there. Five minutes later, you got a, a dart or a brim or a tailor. And sometimes the odd the odd dewy. It was un, unbelievably fun. That was that was a fairly standard occurrence. And then light a fire on the beach because you could back then. <laughs> this is only ten years ago, to find you. <laughs> but you could still could back then. Light a fire and 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 cook your, cook the fish on the on the fire or, or whatever else you found. So there'll be nights that I'd go down to Black Rock and paddle across to Black Rock and climb up the rock, fish off it in big swell. And it was a, it was a pretty famous Mulloway spot. And heaps of tailor. You always come back with a backpack full of tailor. So you're paddling across this, paddling across this big sharky channel on the way back. It's only about a, it was only like 50 meter or maybe a 70 meter um, paddle, but deep and it, and it dark. And you're paddling back to the beach to the to the your lineup is the fire. Well, my lineup was the fire on the beach that I have going, and drag it back and you've got blood blood pouring out of your your backpack. It's kind of funny, and and you get you cop a bit of a wave and you stack it. And, you know, hooks and tackle going everywhere, and then get back to the beach and cook it up. So now sometimes, sometimes I didn't get in it. That was the that were the fun ones. And I still don't ask my fiance. I still don't catch fish. But there'll be there'll be some days I paddle over there and there'll be nothing around. And you come back to the fire and you're like, well, I've got to eat something. To, I mean, of course I could go home. <laughs> That's fine too. But you got, you've got to eat something. So I'd walk down and I'd find crabs. These little sand crabs. I've eaten these guys. They're pretty tasty. They get up to an okay size, like maybe like, um, like the size of an egg almost. And they'd be a chicken's egg. They'd be running around the, the beach at night times and you would run around with a torch grabbing them. And I cooked one up and just fried it, fried it straight up. <laughs> it tasted delicious. It was great. But it was just sort of fun just eating stuff. I've probably got worms full of – I'm probably full of worms at the moment. But, <laughs> 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 but I love it. And – like periwinkles and ar- ar- um, what are they called? Arpus, little um, the little uh, 
crustaceans that grow on the rocks look like They're related to abalone. Little baby, mm. baby apu. They're a little delicacy in Hawaii. Just gra- grabbing those off a rock and boiling them up and making a little soup out of them. And good fun. Good times. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, an amazing flounder dish just a few moments ago. Is it? Do you have any sort of tips or secrets to cooking seafood? What's your approach? Um, yeah, it depends on the seafood for sure. It depends on the on the species of variety, um, and that that's where I'm. Um, uh, take the aging of, of seafood, uh, put it in its place for sure. Um, but it's not the rule that rules all seafood. That's for sure. There's some some fish that is just, and some seafood is just so much better fresh straight away. Absolutely, and and you spend twenty years trying to get that and get the best freshest. Sometimes it's nice to have it straight away. Um, but aging with like the sawfish belly, we've got eight days aging up at the moment on at uh, Baralvina. Um, the flounder we dry out in front of the fan, the skin, take the scales off, crisp up that skin. Um, but there's this, no, and then sometimes don't cook at all. <laughs> Simple as that. Sometimes it's a blowtorch, sometimes it's a charcoal, sometimes it's a pan, sometimes it's raw. And and, and I think that's that's where I get excited with the evolution of, of cooking and, and eating. Because then you, someone will come along, a chef will come along and, start working in the kitchen and do something completely different and you're like that's unreal that's so cool that's that falls in the category and i wouldn't have thought of that that's i think that's the, that's the most enjoyable thing about cooking with other people and, and cooking in general that it's constantly changing with your approach to cookery how important are your relationships with the catchers growers and producers yeah they're vital without without them you don't cook <laughs> simple as that without them you, you're just another cook. Simple as that. The I, I always pictured ourselves like as chefs. We're just we're glorified middlemen on the way. You know, there's a there's a an ingredient. A, a tomato is grown on a vine, and it's been nurtured by a farmer. And they've grown. They've taken care of it. Made sure there's no bugs on. It. I was out here today, and my tomatoes flicking off these caterpillars that are starting to attack it. Caring for it the whole time. You get that tomato gets carefully placed in a tray, shipped off to the, the market, to the chef, and then he just ruins it. <laughs> or, do you, or, do, or does he continue that process of nurturing it as much as he can, as a, as a good middleman should, and then deliver it to the customer and deliver it to the end user who really gets to see that, 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 that t- care and feel. and It's almost like the soul of that, that ingredient. I feel like it's a, you can sit without again sounding a bit, a bit cheesy there, but <laughs> getting a bit deep. <laughs> but, but it is it's, it, you know that it's something's been treated with respect and dignity. You know, when a, a piece of fish hasn't just been uh, so a whole fish hasn't been just slapped in a in a tub. You know, and you get a, a, a poor old you know twenty five kilo mulloway in a, in a tiny little seafood box bent up and battered and bashed because he's so big and he's awkwardly sitting in this tub and you're like, wow, you've had a rough trot, haven't you, buddy? <laughs> Someone hasn't been kind to you. you know, so, so getting to the, the supplier, the farmer, the, the fisherman, talking to those guys and saying what you want out of it and, and, and not accepting it when it doesn't arrive correctly as well. That's, and, and knowing that, that you, know, I won't, you won't put up with, with average produce um, is really important because then you have to do less to it. It's, it's purely lazy. You have to do less to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a purely lazy motive. <laughs> you mentioned you were sitting on the beach uh, with Andy when you uh, came up with the idea for the restaurant on your little mission to um, tin Australian anchovies. How close is Elvina to the vision that you had back then? Um, it's, I saw glimpses of it two nights ago. I said that to Andy. I, he said, he said that was amazing. We had a great service on Friday night. And um, it was our first first public service. You know, we did 160 covers and um, over, oh, from lunch, mind you, from, from midday to, to 11 p.m. So it's a long service, but so it was spread out really well, just in case there's any COVID off- officers listening in. <laughs> 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 I to cover myself there, uh, and, and I said said to Andy, I was like, "Mate, I just saw glimpses of what we we talked about." And he goes, 
it's so clear. <laughs> I was like, it's so satisfying. There were lots of lots of man hugs and <laughs> high fives and that type of stuff. We had a had a review, uh, just a comment on on Instagram. Sorry, not a review, a comment on Instagram from a customer saying saying it was so nice to see the the team all working together. They looked like they were family. The amount of hugs I saw and, and the high fives, and I was like, oh, that's cool. That's and we're not. It's not forced or bunged on. We just we really love working with each other. It's just it's really enjoyable. We've got a really really good team up there. We've got a core team of eight people, and they're just we're all absolutely loving it. It's really cool. The that vision was that, and the dish that we were that the, our oysters on the menu now are still John's, so which is cool. So that was part of the vision. We we're down there eating John's oysters, and I had them in. I had them in some paper bark and they were on a log smoke that was really softly smoking them at about 50 degrees, not even, just, just, just above blood temperature. So you'd pick them up and they'd be leaving on there for about five, ten minutes and they just, they'd, so the texture didn't change, just the, the flavour went from brine to savoury. It was really wild but without ever tightening the muscle, which was really cool. So we're sitting there having that and plenty of Chardonnay, of course. Um, and and so we're we're, we're selling um, those same oysters with some paper bark. You know, so as it goes out the table, we chuck the oyster, take take the lid off, flip it, put the lid back on again, just sitting on top, reserving all the liquid. Light the paper bark underneath, and the paper bark just sort of oozes through that lid, and you get just a soft touch of, of smoke, just as you as you go to eat it. It's not not just. Uh, theater and i think it's actually practical and that's that's the vision we had back down there so yeah it's definitely translated what's it been like putting this restaurant together and letting go of some of the old school thoughts on the way restaurants should be run and what sort of investment they should have how's it felt letting go of that and moving forward with this model it's been liberating it really is i remember saying to a friend of mine um yeah, she said, what, what any positives you can see out of out of COVID? And I said, well, it's probably a really good chance for the industry, the formula to reset and we can run it our way. I was thinking of, and, and I'm probably completely wrong in saying this, um, but I was thinking of countries that have gone through pandemics and, and through wars and, and what their food structure was afterwards. And nearly all of them had the same structure. They do one thing and do it really, really well. Simple, good food, done well. Low budget, really humble, go back to the roots and just cook good food and great food and great service, lots of smiles, keep the positivity high. And, and so we, we, that, that was part of the plan. We said, let's just, let's do a, let's just do a place. We don't, we're not after money. We don't want to make squillions of dollars. It's not the plan at all. We, want, we just want to have a really nice life and go to work and just have big, happy faces. It's just it's, the stress and the... Headache and the the other you know, tiny margins just aren't worth, and yeah, you know, and the grey hair and the and the man boobs aren't worth it. You know, it's got, you got if you're gonna have grey hair and man boobs, at least have a smile on your face. So that was that was what the reality I came to. <laughs> so so that's what we've decided to do, and and that is really liberating. It feels it feels great because yeah, there's there's always a bottom line that we've got to watch out for. But it's not the goal. We're not we're not sitting there chasing money. We just want a really good life, and it's the start of something else. We'll we'll do something else. We'll still do the anchovies. We've got next season. We've got about eight months to to get our bums into gear to get that going. <laughs> we've had our first first test batch, but um, yeah, we've got a little bit of time to get that going until next year, until the next season comes around. But, so there's there's other things going on, and we just we just want to build a place that we want to go to, basically. I know you've only had a couple of services now, but it's but it is warming up, and we're heading into summer. What what are your hopes for the summer? I hope the New South Wales lifts the um the restrictions. Actually, <laughs> it'd be really nice to see it humming at full pace, uh, especially the standing rule, which I just never really understood. You've, you've already counted the customers before they when they've walked in the door, they've all had to log in. So I don't understand why you need to stand uh, sit down to have a drink. If you know, it'd be really tough. It's just sort of blown a bit of atmosphere. I miss having um, miss having a bar four deep, you know, and and the buzz and the, and the excitement that creates, and it's just it's unreal. So hopefully, I really hope by the end of the year that's lifted. Um, I, I just want a continuation of what we've started, what we've got going here, um, 
and because it because it feels right and it's really enjoyable to be a part of it's really enjoyable and and maybe it is a bit of the absence makes the heart go fonder you know of being uh, within a, 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 a venue and, and with a group that there's all got the same goals and, and super stoked um, and maybe it's just our, that we have missed the industry so much as well maybe it's if we come back with all this you know all this excitement and all this time and integrity to put it back into it um, I remember going to um, uh, Dear Santa Louise about two weeks ago and it was just so good to have dinner out again it was such a good feeling I nearly cried <laughs> it was just like Oh, I remember this. <laughs> Spoiled brats. It's like, we think we took it all for granted too much. <laughs> well, Jesse, um, glad to hear that you've got the uh, restaurant up and running and, and it really is, sounds like something that's coming from deep within you and making you really happy. Um, loved having a chat with you, mate. You're a bloody good laugh and a bloody legend. Um, <laughs> please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. For sure. Thanks, Haku Ledge, mate. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.